This is part of the data in that series that we've been organizing since January. Um, it is a collaboration between Yad and uh, EC Norva from the Faculty of Communications and Social Sciences of the University of Lisbon. And the goal really is to create a conversation about data and what data does in society and the different kind of dimensions of data. Data has social dimensions, economic dimensions, technological dimensions. And today we'll hear a bit about what art can do with data. And I think how we can use art to explore these different dimensions. In October, so we'll stop for um, summer now. And in October, we'll have Timnit Gebru, who used to work at Google. She was the head of the ethical AI uh, group at Google. She was fired from Google uh, for criticizing the efforts that Google is making in AI. So I think that would be a really cool talk. Afterwards, we have Anne Hoffman Lauren from University of Washington. And uh, she's more a philosopher and she's going to talk to us about the discourse is surrounding this idea that AI is the future and that AI makes us makes the world a better world. And finally, we have Chris Kazim Mentali from Cornell. Um, he's done a lot of work on civic media, and he's going to talk to us about how other entities, aside from these huge platforms, can collect data, can use data, and can make data visible. So I think that will also, that's where we'll finish. And I think, you know, we, we haven't covered everything, but we will have covered some ground and I think start with a conversation that is much needed. And so without further ado, I will uh, hand it over to my colleague, Madeleine, who will introduce our speaker. With many thanks to Madeleine also for her collaboration, for her help, for her work. Okay, thank you, Anna. Thank you all and welcome. Uh, for me, it's a pleasure to, to be here and to, to, and thank you for your presence. And just let me introduce you, Natalie, Natalie Bookshin. She's an interdisciplinary artist that over literally the last three decades has worked with video, sound, interactive installations, photo, photo film, performance, bro embroidery, drawing, uh, her work has been explored the, the paradoxes and the, the contradictions of this mass connectivity, and she has explored the emancipatory potential uh, for solidarity among the strangers, among strangers, and among this anonymous um, collective collective uh, in the networked society. She has been considered a pioneer of net art and her works have, have been explored since her early days, these critical issues. Natalie has, uh, Natalie's work has been exhibited and screened in MoMA, LACMA, Tate, Pompidou, Whitney Museum uh, in Europe, for example, in Barcelona, La Virena Center for the Image. Uh, she has been uh, also uh, studied and uh, uh, quoted by uh, some of the scholars we, we read and write with uh, like J, J, WJT Mitchell, Wendy Chun, uh, Jamie Barron. She was also, as she has also re received so many awards and fellowships from Guggenheim, Rockefeller, uh, the Jerome Foundation, the um, MacArthur Foundation. The list is enormous. <laughs> Um, and we are very pleased to have Natalie here today. She was, she's going to reflect on this theme of datafication, and I think it, it's a clear relation with her work. And the presentation is, is entitled, Can the Subjectivity and Humanity of a Person Escape the Reach of the Algorithm? Thank you so much, Natalie. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you for uh, the introduction. Let me just start by sharing my screen. Okay, so the very funny thing is that you can you can all hear me and you see the screen, right? Uh, I there's a, there's an organization that's doing an, an archive right now on on uh, sort of uh, people who've been working with technology artists who've been working with technology for a long time, and as part of uh, sort of my, me gathering my stuff. Uh, to, you know, send to them. Uh, this morning or yesterday, I rewrote my bio 
and a lot of the phrases so which which madalena just just read and uh a lot of the things that i say in it i'm gonna say today because i was like oh yeah that sounds that's right because you know when you've been working for a really long time you know you are always going back and sort of rethinking your work in relationship to the present um and you know, it's almost not your work anymore when you've done something so long ago. So it's kind of interesting to think about it. So anyway, so I'm going to repeat <laughs> what Madalena has said, which is that, and I also, I had to use a calculator to count how many years I've been working. And, you know, I'm not ashamed. <laughs> I'm not ashamed of my age, but it's true that I've been, I've been working um, for almost 30 years. Uh, you know, sort of thinking about tech, new, the relationship of new technology to to um, sort of the the porousness of boundaries between self and other, um, the containment and movement of bodies, sort of like that line between the containment and movement of bodies, the the line between individuals and collectives, and as Madalena said, um, my work in really different ways over you know a long period of time has explored the paradoxes, the contradictions, and the unintended consequences of mass collectivity. Um, and I would say that's until, my, until the most recent work, and I'm going to try, I'm going to set a timer because I, I want to say like two words about that because Madalena asked me to. So anyway, I'm very happy to be here. Um, I, I think that my work uh, and the way I'll talk about it probably runs a little bit parallel rather than intersects with these with the questions of data. Um, but I wanted to start uh, because this conference or this series is about data. I wanted to start by just talking very very briefly about my process um, for making the artwork that you'll that I'll be showing you tonight. And actually, before I say that, what I'm going to also say is that I'm not exactly giving a paper. I mean, I'm not giving a paper. I'm going to be showing you like a sort of long trajectory of work, little clips from work. So if you have an impulse to ask a question about any particular work, you know, just put your question in the chat because I'll be moving on. It's not like there's a coherent beginning, middle, and an end. Um, so then hopefully we can get to it. So anyway, the process that um that I sort of go through when I'm making my work, and this is the work that I'm going to talk about today. Um, often starts by gathering a, a big collection of videos, of videos in Saud. And um, sometimes, at least, uh, you know, some of the time I find, I, I collect videos from the internet, videos that I find. Sometimes I've worked with people to make videos, and sometimes I've made them myself. But it always starts um, with, with a big collection of material. And the reason I bring that up is because, you know, sort of like data um, and like you could say machine learning, right? Machine learning needs a lot of videos, <laughs> right? In order to sort of, uh, in order to learn, right? It needs to be fed videos. A lot of those videos that it's being fed, you know, sort of I, I've been using as well. And um, like an algorithm, I sift through the data looking for patterns and relationships that can't easily be detected in the single in a single video alone um, and while i don't really like the title of my talk originally was beyond the algorithms reach um, and i really don't think anyone is beyond the algorithms reach so you could say that was a polemic <laughs> and um what i what i want to say though is that the decisions that i make um are decisions that I'm that 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 are filtered through me, you know, in my subjectivity that I am not automating the decisions. Um, there are a lot of artists who do use algorithms, but even though I use a lot, of, I have a lot of data for my material. Um, for me, it's really, really important to do to do the sifting by hand and also to um, to well, I think about the material that I gather. Um, sometimes I call it a, a kind of ethical appropriation, but I think that the maybe the better way to a better way to say it is that I actually fall in love with the material, and I fall in love with the sort of how people because this is all 
you know, sort of videos that other people are making, you know, I fall in love with, and I'm super interested in looking at the world through, through someone else's eyes. And, um, okay, so that's all I'm going to say about it until I start showing work. And I wanted to start at the very beginning of when I started using videos, um, collecting videos um, from YouTube to make films and videos. And the first piece that I did was all the way back in uh, 2007. And this is the very early days of YouTube. And you will see that from this video because the resolution is very low, which is something that you know is often in, in tech, technological terms that's seen as bad, like the image is really bad. But I but I find that low quality, you know, sort of really beautiful, like the texture, you know. So there's an aesthetics uh, to it for me. The work is called Parking Lot, and um, it's basically I collected videos where people uh, made. Uh, videos of themselves and their friends occupying parking lots to do things to do silly things to play to gather to dance and um and all around the world so there are uh super stores and chain stores from all around the world where people are making these videos and then they um upload it onto youtube and uh, Madalena said this, but I'm going to say it again, <laughs> which is that one of the things in retrospect that I realized that a lot of this work was doing is it was trying to look for the emancipatory possibility, you know, of of a kind of uh, is it possible for strangers or for people to be together in sites like parking lots or the internet, social media that that fully embodies society's near demolition of those of those possibilities of of gathering. So it's a kind of trying to look, you know, for some air, you know, within these constraints. And so in parking lot, I can, you could say that there's two parallels. There's there's uh, videos that are uploaded loaded on YouTube, social media, right, which is a branded site. And then there's the late capitalist architecture. So I was thinking about these sort of small acts of rebellion, you know, within these two sites. And I'm going to show you uh, two minutes out of a 12 minute video or two minutes something. So, okay. I'm in a parking lot, a parking lot, parking lot at Costco, a parking lot, a parking lot in a handicapped spot. In a parking lot at Costco, waiting in the car. cut it short but um so i that was a kind of cut around in the video um and the next you can you'll you'll see the progression from that work to the next work that i did in in the next couple of works that i'm going to show you i began um downloading videos of uh of single people making videos of themselves so people who were looking in front of the camera as if it were a mirror and either speaking, you know, sort of video blogs, uh, vlogs, or performing in one way or another. And I started to work on this, uh, I, I decided instead of working in a single channel like this, that I wanted to sort of show the videos simultaneously, so that you could kind of see that, or in some ways it would reflect the way that online there's never just one video, it's always a chain, and there's always a kind of chain reaction where one begets another begets another. 
And I was trying to think about like, how do I, how do I show that in a video, not, not by sort of cutting. I mean, you look at this video now and it looks like super cuts, right? But that wasn't really a thing <laughs> back then. And I would say, um, I'm going to, the work I'm going to show you is from 2009, the next work. And the format that I use is now a format that we experience every single day. Well, not if you're in school <laughs> during COVID um, with Zoom. So, so there's, I, I have multiple uh, rows of talking heads or people who are doing something on a screen sort of within the same frame. And when I did that, that wasn't really a thing, <laughs> you know, but now it's completely changed. I mean, now, which is also something about working with technology as a researcher or as an artist that that sort of things and ideas and technologies change so fast. So a lot of times what you end up doing ends up being, you know, sort of historical as well as as theoretical. OK, so this this work, I'm going to show you um, two clips from it. It's normally shown as an installation. And then I'll just say a few words about it. Okay, so this is just a still, so you can see it looks like Zoom. <laughs> uh, and here is one clip. I'm going to stop there. So the title of the work uh, is called Mass Ornament, and it comes from um, an essay. Some of you might be familiar with it. It's by a German um, critic, uh, critic, critic of film, uh, theorist of film from the er, from the tw uh, 20th century, and he wrote an essay called Mass Ornament in um, 1927. Krakauer is his name, a German, and in it he analyzes uh, popular dance troops, which at the uh, uh, of chorus line dancers, so women who you know dress similarly, who uh, you know sort of move synchron in, in synchronicity, um, and he argues that they resemble factory workers in an assembly line. That like factory workers, their um, their their uh, limbs or their are kind of abstracted, right? So you only have a portion of their body doing certain kind of work, and together they form what he calls a mass ornament which he argues is like capital. It's something that they don't have any access to. Like you can't see it when you're in the dance. And I was really, when I made this work, it was, uh, I, I started it in 2008 and there had just at that, that year, there was a big recession, you know, really huge recession. And I was thinking about, you know, sort of depression era um, forms of entertainment and um, you know, how, how entertainment has changed. So when I made this work, mostly video wasn't mobile. So people were at, in their homes. So they're really constrained to uh, not just the screen, but also to this space, to their space at home. So they don't need a choreographer to give them the dances, right? They've internalized the dance and they're working uh, for free, right? Or for likes. So 
you know, and so there's a kind of it instead of I don't know if uh, the chorus line is sort of uh, the entertainment for Fordism for modernism, then I was thinking, well, maybe the dance is a kind of entertainment form or the YouTube or YouTube making YouTube videos, social media um, is the form for uh, sort of a contemporary that reflects contemporary economic sort of realities. And I was really interested in trying to show not just the similarities, but also uh, gestures where people look like they're kind of pushing against the edges of the frame that in which they're encased. So um, a lot of times in the work, I'm sort of, on the one hand, I, there's a critique, but on the other hand, there's also a kind of search for, for something else. And in this case, there's also sort of the pleasure, right? That, that people are, you know, exhibiting themselves for pleasure, right? And for likes, but also for fun. So um, the next work I'm gonna show you, and I'm, racing through is uh, a work I did right after this one. And if that last work sort of recalls a, um, recalls a chorus line, then the next work recalls a Greek chorus. And it's composed of, of uh, many utterances that I compiled together from uh, YouTube, from vlogs on YouTube. And it, um, you know, sort of in a, there's a kind of collective narrating of the self that happens. And I won't say more about it. I will just show it to you and we could talk about it later if you like. So I'm gonna show you, th there were a number of chapters that I did over um, a number of years, but I'm gonna show you two of the earliest ones, um, one and then the next in a row, I think. So today, today really I enter a new phase suck. in my life. I went into work. work. Oops. Sorry about that. Let's try that again. So today, today really I enter a new phase sucked. in my life. I went into work. work. Like any other day. And my clock in card is missing. And uh, so my manager comes up to me. One of our directors called me into an office. My bosses called me um, in the office and said, uh, can I, I talk, talk to you? To you? And, and I, was, I wasn't sure what was going on. I was but, um, expecting I something bad to happen. And basically, one of the larger people in the company and someone from Human Resources was there. And next thing you know, the hiring manager walked in. And, and he started off with, well, this is a part of the job I really don't like. And I'm like, Jesse, you what the fuck? Go um, what's going on? He me I'm like, unemployed. You fire me? Fired, so like, no. He says, yes, we're going to, like, the route's not making enough money. Really I said, no, sorry. when does it start? You're a really great worker, but unfortunately, I'm unfortunately the business has not been good. The guys have been sitting around the shop just sit around in large numbers. People that were walking by to come over and then they finally the owner cut everybody's hours down to like nothing and uh, myself and a lot of other people between my center and the other center and size the city, my people. entire department 600 was people were laid off. off which is it's not a good thing due to financial the reasons and sales the and stuff are, that our companies not they work so at well. is shutting down the company's going my out company of business to close. Oh, look, my position at work my Position became redundant. No more. My got rid of go. the position. I got downside. I've been Recess. removed from my duties. Suspended. Whatever. Fire. Whatever word you want to use. They're outsourcing my job. I, I have, have been, been working at that place for nine years. Ten years. Two years. Two years. Eight months. Eight years. Eight years. Eight years. Eight years. Three years. Twenty-five years. Three and a half years. Since I was sixteen, December of '06. And it was just like, wow. As you can imagine, this came as a total shock. I'm in shock. Um, well, as I've been there three months, I've, I've always never worked once hard, had always anybody given sit me down and say they were happy with the quality of my work worked, or the speed at which know, I was really, working. Really hard. Or feel betrayed. The way I conducted myself. I feel betrayed. Feel good. How I dealt with people, etc. It was very shocking. I, I didn't realize it was coming. I didn't, didn't feel um, coming. Some people um, were aware of it kind of happening. I just didn't expect it. I didn't see it coming at all. Be so sudden. So, so, 
<clears throat> some good news. Good news is that I'll get a chance to now work on my work on work. more work on my skills to to pursue what I really want. And, and right now, you know, I actually I, I feel kind of kind of liberated. I think it's positive. I, uh, I feel pretty positive. I feel pretty good about my situation. I was kind of excited to get the hell out of there. I'm actually kind of looking forward to having a little time. Oh, my hands to make More time to laser out of the house. To do clean. stuff around the house. Read. I think I haven't had enough time to be reckless. Spend with Get my yard Cindy cleaned up and, and my Mike. job. Maybe I'll go on vacation. vacation. Make some uh, YouTube videos. Yeah, I might as well make some Maybe videos. Maybe do video blog. Uh, I think I'm going to go into it. We'll see. I don't know. I guess we'll see. Monday, I'll go to the uh, Virginia Employment Commission, and I'm going to start looking, looking for a new job. job. Probably get a better job, better. along with 600 others that will be also trying to find a job. So yeah, now I'm uh, fighting for my life, basically. I could use your prayers for and, uh, another job. Let's say some asshole on top of his pile. We don't know what God uh, has planned right now. But, Still got uh, his Mercedes and his million pound. We're just trusting that. Uh, Hopefully, they'll let me stay on as a company driver. Too. So, anyway, folks, anyway, that's my story, have a good evening. and have a good uh, pretty Thank much that's about it, and, and uh, myself and uh, a lot of other people knocking on my door want money, that's about it. Anyway, I'm going to turn this camera around, so I'm going to stop. Actually, I, before I show the other one, I just wanted to say, say a couple things about that one. Um, first of all, it's a little bit hard to hear because when it, typically it's, Inst it's installed so that uh, there are many different speakers so that you can kind of, you know, the sound is split across so you hear echoes of people speaking rather than people talking right on top of each other. So that's a little bit, that's a little bit tricky. But the other thing, and maybe this is something to talk about later, which is that you wouldn't really be able to find any videos like that today on YouTube because it's a completely changed environment, right? Like the it's so, um, you know, it's become so professionalized, right? And at the time, uh, Google had bought YouTube recently, but they hadn't quite figured out how to make money from it yet. And I think that was even before they started ingesting videos, uh, you know, sort of ingesting them for their AI. And most of the videos that I found, like at the time I was thinking about trying to trick the algorithm that I would search, because I, I had to use you know, sort of hundreds of videos to make these things and, uh, and sort through them by hand, <laughs> which I didn't mind doing because, you know, I was kind of interested in, in, in the way people were telling stories differently. But um, I was able to, first of all, I was able to get to the bottom of the search, which is something you could never do now, right? But also I think that people's relationship to, the, to social media is so different because there's been so much abuse, right? Uh, through comments and so it's sort of so slick and it's it's i mean people here are actually i mean it's a kind of sad piece in a certain i mean these are sad for me because there was a kind of a, still a desire to be like a belief that you might be able to find someone out in the ether who you could connect with and so there's this uh there's a kind of naivety to the way that they they are interacting with the tech with technology that I think would be really hard to find today. And maybe that's even truer with the next one, which I'm gonna show it's just a minute long, but, and we can talk about it later. Okay. So, um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to my medications. I'm on Depakote, 500 milligrams. I'm on Sir, Seroquel, 50 milligrams, once before bedtime. I'm taking Geodon, Risperdal, Flexa, 40 milligrams of Prozac, Prozac, and half a milligram of Xanax at night. I'm in the process of switching medication. From Amlethium to Carbamazepine, Brimerol to Deloxetine, and Flexoprom to Pristique. And... Now I'll only take and clonopin. And I'm feeling really much better. So although I showed this, I, I would show this work in in art settings. Um, I also, 
I also uh, put it back online uh, on YouTube and I sent it to all the people that were included in the work as, oops, For sorry. those of you who doubt, okay. I'm sorry. And I, and I sent it as reaction videos to people so that, because once it's online, I mean, I, it's also a question I get a lot from, I would say mostly from students about, about the ethics of appropriation, which um, I would say that um, the way that I was thinking about the way that I was thinking about this material is that we that with that this this space this platform had become the new the new public the new pu public arena and so just like taking a picture of somebody a documentary photographer taking a picture of somebody in the street I was I mean this I was take I was sort of documenting um, documenting a kind of current conditions on the internet. And I tried to do it in a way that was not making fun of anyone, that was respectful, that was always more than the individual part on its own. And, um, and I also submitted it to, I, I, sent, I sent it to people so they could respond. Mostly they didn't, a few times they did, but I don't even know if you have reaction, if there are reaction, reaction videos anymore. Um, but the other thing is that uh, I would say um, is that all, I mean, all of this stuff is actually owned not by people, but by Google. <laughs> you know, so if anyone were to, were to sue me, <laughs> it would be, it could be Google who owns it. Um, but in any case, I mean, that's not really, the question is really more like how, how does, how do one, how does one deal with, you know, something that someone else made and, um, Part of it is that I don't claim that I made it, right? That it it, re, it retains its integrity as what it is, rather than you know sort of uh, shifting shifting um, its meaning. But anyway, I'm going to move on and we can we can discuss. So I'm the I'm going to jump uh, way ahead to uh, so this was this was 2008, and I'm going to jump to a. Uh, uh, a film that I made. I'm going to just show you a small piece of it um, in that I completed in 2016. It was sort of the end of this project. And it was a work where I actually, instead of downloading videos, I worked, I spent a year um, working with people to make their own videos, but still using the, the same forms um, because I wanted to talk about not just sort of the topic, which, uh, um, but I'll, well, well, I wanted to talk about the relationship of the economy to technology. So the, the piece itself, um, I'm just scrolling up for a second, hold on. The film is, is called Long Story Short and it's a 45 minute film. And um, I was exploring poverty as a social experience. And in the United States and probably elsewhere as well, um, poverty is really sort of uh, generally described as an individual's problem. And the fault is always sort of the individual and the, the mistakes they, they made. And so I wanted to kind of work against that using a similar form to explore the intersection of the individual and the collective and to, um, to figure, to animate a very large archive and to facilitate listening to a group of people who are the most impacted by advanced technologies and who, despite having important insights and perspectives per and persevere um, under crisis level economic conditions are systematically excluded from political discourse and from public view. So these are stories and people that you don't see on social media because they're the stories that people don't, don't tell. Um, and, um, I think that's all I'll say about it. I'm going to show you, let me see how much time we have. I'm going to show you a little bit. <laughs> we'll see how long. I have a short clip here. I grew up in a small town in Arkansas called England, Arkansas, population 3,060 people. That was a set of railroad tracks that ran through the middle of the town. Whites on one side, blacks on the other. I grew up in on the wrong side of the street. On my side of the street were ran down apartments, and then on the opposite side of the street were 
upscale condos. The whites owned all the property and the farms, and the blacks worked on the farms. But out here in California... I seen only black people. I didn't grow up with many white people around. It was pretty, pretty much, much just us. Hispanics, Hispanics and Latinos, Latinos. A lot of African Americans and uh, Mexicans lived on the flatlands. It's not like in a very good neighborhood. Not the good areas of L.A. And then predominantly um, middle class rich people, people that people who have good money live, live in, in the hills. hills you know they don't want to be where the urban people are you know they don't want to be where all the poverty is and all the people who are homeless it's not you know i mean a coincidence this was done all over the united states we were like pretty much secluded from the regular city you know and they have it all cornered in and contained right there around the police station the air even smells different <laughs> for some reason and, and the police is patrolling to make sure that we don't bother the nice neighborhoods. I'm, I'll make this more clear. There's not a lot in the neighborhood. It's nothing positive out here. There's so many people out, out of jobs there, out in the street looking for jobs. I would never seen in the, in the suburbs of white neighborhoods. African-American men hanging out on a corner. The white guys hanging out at the liquor store. Matter of fact, they didn't even have liquor stores too much in the suburbs. They have liquor barns or, you know. Okay, in, in my, my neighborhood. neighborhood. In Compton is within a um, two block radius. You have six liquor stores. We see liquor, liquor stores. stores. We have it's like a, a liquor, liquor store on, on every, every corner. corner. You know, uh, do the math. My name is Melinda Emilian. My interests are, I love to read. I love knowledge. I love computers. And I like being a mom. I like doing the mom thing. Uh, only thing I really like doing is reading. It takes me out of my situation. You know, it, um, I don't know, it takes me into an, um, like I said, it takes me out of my situation that I'm in now. But even when I'm not in a situation, I still like to read, but I really like to read now more than ever, more than ever. I like Facebook. <laughs> it also takes me out of the situation because you can be anybody you want to be on a computer. It could be anybody. Not that I want to be somebody different, but, oh, I sound like I'm contradicting myself. Oh, I don't want to see this one said. <laughs> I like reality shows, but reality shows is reality. You know, you can't, you know, I mean, not that they're really reality because they're all edited and stuff, but, you know, what's happening is live, you know, it's, it's them. But in a book, you know, you can create your own ending. You can create your own beginning, you know, even though it's someone else's story that they're telling. And I like that. Okay, so the, the last work I'm going to... I think sometimes people... Let's see. The last work I'm, uh, I'm going to show is, is a, a piece that I did last year, and it's, um, it's an installation that I made in an empty apartment in Germany, and it's called Ghost Games, which is a German word, um, a phrase for uh, football games or soccer games that are played behind closed doors without a live audience. And the, the work was made during COVID. It is a COVID piece. <laughs> there, there was, you know, there, there at the time of there was a lot of conversation about people, I mean, not wanting to see COVID pieces <laughs> because, or thinking about like, sort of how will artists deal, how will artists deal with the situation? And I have to say that I am still figuring out how to talk about this work um, because it was so, the work that I can talk about best is work that I've done much uh, for that's sort of much further away, but this is so close and it's so close in terms of um, in terms of what we're li still living through now. Um, but I'll, I'll say I just want to say a few things about it. Um, so it, it also works with an archive. I also use an archive for this one um, and 
for it, I, um, I put out a wide call. Let's see, I think I, I can get you to a link. I'm not sure if it will open and you can see it. Can you see that? The link? Yeah, okay. So I put, I put out a wide call asking for participation and I asked for um, people um, and it was, it was spread really widely. It was spread through, I mean, it, it was in different languages and it uh, was sent by many different networks. Um, and I asked people um, who were at home, this was at the height of, of, the, current, of, of the pandemic in over a hundred countries at the time had um, you know, different levels of lockdown. And I asked people if they would record sounds of um, just sort of sounds that they heard and but make a video so they would uh, make a video of what they were looking at when they heard the sound. And I got over 100 videos from so many different countries. And part of it was that, I mean, part of my interest was that, um, hold on, I'm gonna show you just a slide. I know I haven't been making this full screen, but it's kind of easier or else I feel like I get lost. I get, I get lost in the screen. But um, part of my interest was that it seemed that the only safe sense at the time was sound, you know, you know, if you wanted to be intimate with somebody else, like a stranger, you know, sound travels, sound from, from one person can travel and hit the ear of another. So it's a kind of a touching. And then the other thing that seemed to be happening a lot is that while people were isolated at home, um, there was more of a sense of interconnectivity because as streets, as cities emptied out, you know, there was a, there was a, um, a shared, uh, soundtrack of ambulances, of funeral bells, of sirens in the United States and also all across um, the world or many parts of the world in that first summer of COVID, you know, after George Floyd was killed, there were sounds of protests and then police sirens. So, so, so what I did in this work is I, it's, I, I worked with montage, but the way that I used montage was again, very different than the other work. I, um, montaged videos that people sent me um, directly to the different ar different architecture in the space. So I was like literally montaging video, montaging video with the site so that you can see here like the texture of the wall um, through this projection or in this, I, I don't know how well you can see it. So I have a lighter one, but this is a phantom room within a room. So I made these montages where I have different windows with different sounds from different places coming out of them. And it's actually just a, a, a 3D projection, but it feels like you're in a phantom room. So I wanted to haunt the house and haunt it with kind of the ghosts of, the ghosts of, um, I don't know, of, of death, of social, dis, uh, you know, sort of disruption of, um, you know, of a kind of trauma, a kind of collective trauma um, in this one. I mix the sound from the streets. I have speakers over the windows. So it's in the middle of a city in a um, small town in East Germany, a, in the middle of an industrial area. So there's a, there were a lot of sounds in the streets below, but then that mixed with sounds from um, that I received. So it was kind of uh, montaging these different spaces together. And um, in this one, there is, I'm not gonna play this video because we're almost out of time, but um, there's a protest happening outside of the window um, that's projected. And um, okay, so what I want to do now is um, I'm done talking about finished work, but and this is for Madalena. <laughs> so because I, I right now I'm in the middle of, of working on a new project and it has nothing to do with technology, I think right now. So this is a, this is a first in a really long time, but it is. Hold on, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. But I would say that the link to the previous work is that it's also so in Ghost Games. I didn't say this, but maybe it's important to say because um, the way it transitions to the new work. I was thinking about the private home um, at like a private individual body. Right, that you know, with COVID, it became really apparent, right, that bodies were in, were interconnected, right, that that you shared breath, 
and the home too, the private home, you know, is sort of not not safe from the realities of the world, right? Which leak in, and then you know, eventually a lot of people went out for the protests, um, and so. I would say of all of my work has been sort of thinking about borders. They've been conceptual up to that point and that po and still with ghost games, they're also um, somewhat conceptual. Um, and it's also a lot of my work, as you've seen, oops, I'm, <laughs> have, has been about the kind of boundaries uh, between the self and the collective, right? Um, and if I think back to mass ornament, where people are in their private homes, but trying to escape it in a way that's a kind of interesting link for me with ghost games. So the, the latest work um, I'm writing, is, I'm writing um, which is something I don't usually do first. Um, and it's going to be an essay film, at least right now, that will be a speculative uh, narrative essay film that takes place in the future in an unnamed country. Um, and it explores borders between nations, between humans and non-humans, and between fact and fiction. Now, the, it, it will be, um, what you'll see is an archive of photographs. Um, and what they reveal is that um, a, this unnamed country that um, supposedly had been stealing off the country from its southern border, um, which is thought to have been completed a decade ago, but the area was closed off for security reasons. It in fact was never completed and the wall is no longer standing. So it's a kind of Potemkin village uh, for the public or a reverse Potemkin village and um, providing security to those who need it, but allowing the necessary flow of, of uh, human and non-human migration across imaginary borders, including national borders. So we'll see if that's what I end up doing, but that's what it is at this point. So thank you very much.